Did you ever think what life would be like without art, music, poetry, sculpture, and the other creative outlets that human beings use to experience transcendence? This is the topic we will be discussing, art as a path toward meaning and enlightenment. Please join me. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson. We will be discussing art as a path toward meaning and enlightenment. This program is dedicated in loving memory of our dear friend Sharon Gans. She will forever be remembered. Her teachings will live on and continue to inspire so many. To appreciate something, it's always best to visualize what life would be like without it. We take for granted many things in our lives. So if we didn't, something didn't exist, imagine life and then you can appreciate what that thing may be. Let's discuss this in the context of the arts. When I say the arts, I mean art as everything from visual arts moving arts, music, poetry, sculpture, calligraphy, architecture, carpentry, embroidery. Obviously, I'd be missing quite a few, but just to give a, 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 an example, what would life be without music, without art? It's hard to imagine. Would it just be boring and bland? Would, we, would there be higher rates of depression and other forms of uh, negative behavior? What would it be like? I think about it quite often. You know, music and, uh, and melody, for example, is a different type of language. It's not just taking words and putting them to a sing-song. It just evokes something very differently. And the same thing when you look at a beautiful piece of art or the other forms of expression that are not quite the tangible, concrete ways we communicate, whether it's through words or writing or actions. When I say actions, I mean the mundane, pedestrian, daily routines that we go through. So how do we capture what, these, what, the art, what art contributes? I want to use one word, transcendence. And let's explain what that means. The opposite of transcendence is survival. Other way of putting it, animal bliss. I remember once, my earlier years, riding up north, upstate New York. It was one of the first times I saw country life. I grew up in New York. I'm born and bred in New York. A very industrial city, a busy city with a lot of beauty, going through its own challenges now. Nevertheless, I didn't really see country, suburban, and uh, life, a rural life. And I remember going up the highway, and I saw on the side cows grazing in the meadow, in a field. I decided to stop. You know, what's a cow? It doesn't seem like an exotic creature. There are many pictures of it. I mean, there are exotic creatures on earth. Cow, you wouldn't call one of the seven wonders. But I was taken by the cow's calmness. Just staying in one place for a long period of time, grazing, feeding on the grass, and thinking about it, a very beautiful, serene life. No neurosis, no need for therapy. The cow does what it needs to do, it breeds takes care of its young, it feeds. If it's a milk cow, it offers milk. 
And that's that. There are no highs, there are no lows. I don't know if a cow has a bad mood or a good mood. I didn't interview the cow. But I saw with my own eyes something that is very stark, in stark contrast to human beings where we have all our complexities and we have our moods and we have our cha- needs for our neurosis and our, the therapy we need, the psychological things that haunt us. On the other hand, I'll say human being has something called a drive. You know, we aspire, we look upward. We constantly build better technologies, better homes, better devices to make our lives easier. The cow is very comfortable with where it is. So when you're very, if you're living a very anxious life, it can be very enviable. But it also can be quite monotonous. Now, does a cow respond to music, to art? Does it need it? Perhaps not. Or maybe it has its own poetry through what it does on its daily routines. But for a human being, that would be um, suffocating. We would not be able to survive because there's another part of us even though we do eat and drink and breed and need shelter and need clothing and we have our so-called meadows where we graze, but we also have another component which is called a need for transcendence. And that's not something that's superimposed. It's part and parcel of who we are. There's an expression, the mystics, the Hasidic masters say that an animal has never seen the heaven. What does it mean? That animals physiologically walk on all four and they don't look up to the sky. Yes, I know people ask me, what about a giraffe? A giraffe just has a longer neck. And it's a taller animal. But it's, what does it mean? That doesn't physically look up. It's also because its spiritual, psychological makeup is not one that needs to look up, needs to aspire. Its role is to live and survive on earth. The human being, however, walks on two feet. And our heads are higher than our legs. And we do look up. We look up to heaven, and we seek, and we wonder, and we imagine, on every possible level. I don't mean it necessarily only on a spiritual, religious level, or religious level. Look, how many, how many billions, if not trillions of dollars have been spent on, has, has been spent on space travel? What's out there to explore? They recently landed on Mars, landing on the moon. Are there others out there? What's just curiosity? But that's who we are. Yes, many industries were spawned from this NASA um, exploration or other space explorations. But that was not the goal. The goal was what is out there. And animals will not look for better homes. They don't have two homes or four cars or even one car or gadgets or mobile or better medical devices, better technologies. They live in the same habitats as they lived 100 years ago and 500 years ago and 1,000 years ago. So it isn't just a quantitative difference, it's a qualitative difference. We have the need for transcendence. And transcendence can take on many different shapes and forms, frankly, even healthy and unhealthy ones. When a person is bored, when a person feels their life is just one routine, they will look for what we call a high, some shift, some novelty, something fresh. It can take on the shape of beautiful things, romance, love, travel, adventures, of course, art, the arts, music, poetry, all the other arts I mentioned, the ones I didn't mention. What do they do? They do something, they relieve the spirit and they allow it to soar beyond its necessary survival needs. For some, it takes on the shape of faith, religion, spirituality. For some, they come together. For some, they don't come together, meaning spirituality and religion. It's another discussion. What do all these things do? They don't just create relief and release, but they actually help you go to a place that's greater than your immediate situation. They inspire. And it's a necessity Now, if we don't get it in a healthy way, we'll go elsewhere. What do you think lies at the heart of addiction, any form of addiction? You think anybody sets out and says, listen, I want to become an addict? Of course not. The human pride 
and human dignity is humiliated by the fact that you're addicted to something, that you're a slave, something is controlling you. So what's the driving force? Something that will give you relief. Something you hold on to. It can be alcohol, it can be drugs, it can be sexuality, it can be gambling, it can be psychological um, phobias, psychological passions, fetishes, anything that creates a type of escape from where you are. But the escape word is a very critical one because true transcendence is not just escape. It's actually arriving to a greater place. So let's take this even deeper. So what is it in the human spirit that drives us toward transcendence? Exactly that word, spirit. The human spirit, the soul, whatever word you use for it is not relevant here, just the, the concept. The difference between a dead person, God forbid, and a live person is that this is not just that we're biologically alive, but we're like a flame. And that's an expression in the book of Proverbs. The flame of the divine flame is the soul of a human being. So look at a flame. It's always flickering, it's always moving, it's restless, and it's always rising. In addition, of course, that it warms, illuminates. Interesting. All in one little flame. So a flame is the closest approximation of what our spirit is like. If you bottle a flame and try to control it, it will get extinguished. It, def- the, it defies the very nature of a flame to try to contain it, to try to stop it, to try to slow it down. That's why it's so fascinating that human beings are trying to master the art of becoming a couch potato, doing nothing. Does a flame do nothing? Is there anything in life is doing nothing? But there's something about it. Some people like that calm, but it's actually not healthy. Yes, we don't want to have extreme anxieties, extreme ups and downs. But like I once told a cardiologist, come, come to my classes. We stay, we stay connected. He listens online. And we, uh, we're in touch. Very beautiful soul, but a lot of gone through a lot of pain in his life. And he said to me, can, Rabbi Jacobson, can you pray to God and just, I should have one calm day in my life. It's not all this aggravation and anguish. So half jokingly or jokingly, I said to him, you mean like a flat line? He said, no, 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 not that calm. A flat line, of course, is not what you want to see in a cardiogram. You want to see waves. Flat line means it's death. Now you want waves that are balanced. You don't want an irregular heartbeat and pulse. You want a wave like that, but it's a wave. So extreme anxiety or extreme ups or downs is not that necessarily healthy. So you want a balanced, but you want a balanced movement. You don't want to end up doing nothing. I understand the the temptation, especially when a person is overwhelmed, but the key is that transcendence is the very nature of who we are to seek out and to connect to something beyond ourselves. You know, when we think about, let's talk in terms of uh, psychological language, the mind. So we talk about the conscious, we talk about the unconscious, the subconscious. I like to use the word superconscious. It's not beneath consciousness, it's above consciousness. So in the Kabbalistic language, there's a state called the hidden intelligence, the superconscious state. And um, what is that? something we don't see, but it's the place where all consciousness arrives from. If you think of consciousness as, let's say, a narrow funnel like a faucet where, where water flows in a regulated way, it's coming from a larger reservoir, a larger body that we cannot see, but we know it's coming from there. The human being is not just comprised of conscious experiences. We seek the, sub, the, un, the superconscious because it's who we are on a deeper level. But here's the paradox. The deeper you go, the less you can really tangibly and concretely relate to it. We don't have the language. We'd love to have it. But basically the world of expression, as we know it, is antithetical to that deeper world of supra, the superconscious state. 
And yet, it's so much part of us. What does that tell us? That not everything that's part of us, that's necessary in life, needs to be understood, or needs to be touched, or needs to be expressed in regular language. And that's where art comes in. Like art, all forms of art, it opens up a door, it's a language from the superconscious state, channeled into the conscious state. And that's why it does what it does to us, which we'll discuss, and why we are so drawn to it. So it's not just escape, not just relief, it's actually accessing parts of you that you yourself cannot, in a conventional way, level, on routine, daily basis, access. And when you do, it lifts up all of you, including the conscious part of ourselves. So to use in the language of the mystics, the soul, that human spirit we spoke about, that flame, has actually five dimensions. It's called the five names the soul has, but names means dimensions. Five states. One, and I'll say them in Hebrew and then translate, one is called nefesh. That's the lowest level. Lowest level meaning the first basic level, which we all relate to biological life. You're breathing, your heart is beating, your mind is working. That's it. The minimum could be even, God forbid, a vegetable in a hospital that can't move but is alive. The maximum, fully healthy human being, walking and talking and doing everything we do. But it stops at the definition, the medical definition of what we call life, spirit. Life spirit. I call it biological life. The next level is called ruach. Ruach also means spirit. But ruach also refers to an emotional life. You feel things. You're attracted to things. You're repelled by others. You connect. You bond. It has love and the other emotions as part of the experience. You, people say sometimes, I feel like a, I feel like a zombie. I feel dead inside. That would be having nefesh, biological, without the emotional. Now, emotional is not only romantic, it's friends, family, and other ways of a person experiencing you feeling things. You're feeling alive in that sense, stimulated. Level three is called neshama. So even though neshama is a famous word for soul, but when you break it into the five, it has a specific category, and that's referring to intellectual life. The mind is now active. Because you can be emotionally active, but not necessarily focused or reflective. We have many impulses. They sometimes get us into trouble, and sometimes they're very beautiful. Sometimes both. So the mind is yet another experience of consciousness, intellectual consciousness. I think, I conceive, I understand, I probe, I evaluate. I'm not discussing now the relationship between the three I just mentioned, but there are three. Those are the called the conscious faculties, the conscious soul, the one we're aware of, and we basically access these resources on an ongoing basis all the time. The next, the next two levels are what we'll call transcendent faculties. There's transcendence and there's transcendence of transcendence. So transcendence, the next one is called chaya, which in other words means life, here you also have transcendent interests. Because intellectual, even though it can be transcendent and can lead you to transcendent, intellectual could also be purely understanding things and not necessarily, like some people like mathematics, but they don't necessarily feel the music of math or the poetry of math. Transcendence is where you are lifted up beyond the conscious to something greater than yourself, even greater than your mind. The mind definitely leads you there, because remember, the conscious mind leads us to the superconscious. And then there's Yechida. Yechida means oneness. This is the one that is most elusive in a way. It's the inner sense of complete state of where you feel you belong. Complete state of inner harmony. And it's not even an exciting, transcendent experience, which would go into the categories that we'll soon talk about, music, art, and so on. But here there's just that inner sense of deep pleasure, which is not conscious necessarily. You feel it because you feel just the, 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 you feel the results of it. Like being submerged in water, knowing you belong. 
feeling you're connected. So you can have transcendence as an experience, but you don't yet feel that total being submerged, or what some would call being in the zone. A seamlessness between object and subject. Where you're not even concentrating on the transcendent or other experiences. You are, you're just it, a state of being more than an experience. A noun more than a verb. Now, just for the record, these five are still called five dimensions. Then there's the essence of the divine of the soul, which is its divine nature connected to something completely beyond that's not even defined in the terms of oneness. But that's not for now. That's another discussion. So where does art belong in all of this? This is the language of the soul, but especially the higher levels, levels of transcendent soul. Because the truth is, when you're eating, when your heart is beating, or your mind is working, or walking, that's also an expression of soul. And, but you can't call it a soulful experience. Music is called soul. Art elicits an element of transcendence. So the arts belong in the fourth and fifth levels, primarily in the fourth level, because they are experiences, and they will lead us, hopefully, to the fifth level, which is what I'm going to explain now. So a good way to put it is, let's talk about expression and non-expression, expression and beyond expression, conscious and superconscious expressions. So I mentioned before that we have language. We use language, talk, radio, Communication. Everyone talks so much about talk today. You know, don't be silent. Break the silence. You don't know what the person you love, they may not know what you're thinking. Express yourself. Sometimes to the point where there's too much talk. But what do we express? You look, look around. It's far easier to express superficial things than deeper things. That's how it is. If someone asks you to, about the weather, about sports, about something very surface level. We can talk on and on and on. If someone says, tell me something about your deepest intimate self, you'll find yourself lacking language. Not just because you don't trust the person, because even for ourselves, we don't really have words. Sometimes you say, and I can't really express what I feel. So we find the word. So what do we do when we want to express something that's more than the conventional words? And why is it the case that when it comes about the real things in life, you find so few words and things that are not real, when I say not real, things that are really superficial, we can talk and talk because words are containers. And like a container, how much can you fit into a container? A certain amount. So the more external it is, the less energy it has, let's put it that way, the less intensity and intimacy it has, less transcendence, the more you can talk about it. Because it doesn't, because the container fits. But when you're talking about things that are deeper, this container is just simply inadequate. It's too small to express a deep feeling of love, a deep yearning, or for that matter, a deep feeling of pain. The container is just too small. So we need wider containers. So what do we do? So we create a new language. This is a language of poetry, of art, of music, metaphor, a language that's not quite limited so what does a song do when you listen to a song that words, regular words don't do? It, 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 it's capturing and reflecting something more than just the word, even if it has lyrics. Something that touches deeper, it's a wider container. And what about when you want to express something even deeper than that? So sometimes it's a one word. You say, oy vey, Yiddish expression. Or wow, or awesome, or God, God, God whatever reason people use that word. Pleasure, pain, sometimes it's just one word that can capture more than volumes. And then there's a place where you don't, even a word, even a sound, even a groan, a sigh, a cry, a laugh cannot capture. Silence. And that captures the deepest part of it all. So if you think about it, the three levels of conscious soul that I described those are all expressible. The intellectual, obviously, the emotional, and action-based, survival-based. Once you get to the fourth level, transcendence, there we need new language, the language of art, of music, and all the other forms of art that human beings use. 
And that leads us to the silence of the fifth level. So it's literally a process. It's a journey. And that's where art, or why art is a path towards enlight- meaning and enlightenment. Because what it's doing is it's opening up chambers and dimensions that are deeper than the conscious. So that's its role. Not just enjoyable, it's necessary. These are the tools. There's an expression used about music, about song, which really can be applied to all art. And that is its soul transportation, soul travel. We know people who have billions of miles, frequent flyer miles, and they haven't moved an inch spiritually or emotionally. And there are people who can sit in one place. I've seen an individual on a Shabbat, on a holiday or a Saturday, under a prayer shawl for hours, not moving, but their soul is moving millions, billions of miles. So movement is not always about physical movement. When you want your body to move, you take your legs and you walk somewhere. If you need to get there quicker or it's a longer distance, we have vehicles. We have unicycles and we have bicycles and we have tricycles and we have ships and helicopters and planes and motorcycles, I forgot to mention, and all types of vehicles. I didn't mention them all, obviously, again. But when you want the soul to move, a physical vehicle will not do it. You need something to touch you in that superconscious place. Something that will create transcendence. And that's where art comes in. So the meaning of meaning and enlightenment is more than just an, a pleasurable experience. Okay, let's go to a concert. Let's hear some nice music. Let's go to an art show. Let's go to a museum. Let's see a work of art that will mesmerize us. It's much more than just that. It's actually a tool and instrument for growth, for becoming a different type of human being. Unfortunately, humans, we like to fit everything into boxes. Even our transcendent experiences becomes also a commodity, a commercial enterprise. When in truth... These are ways of becoming something greater than yourself. What the mystics would call serving something beyond you. There's an obligation involved. Most people who hear music or art or see art will not say, I'm obligated. No, there is obligation. I mean in a beautiful way. Because it helps you serve and live out the purpose of your life in a deeper way. So it's not just about you enjoying it, escaping It's transformational. That's what it's meant to be. That's why prayer, real prayer, is actually called song. Because it's a way of serving. It's with the service of the heart. Emotional expression. Now you'll say, didn't I say emotional is the second level? But I mean emotional expression, obviously. Emotions that lead you into transcendent emotions. Into superconscious emotions. And the same thing with the mind. Even though it exists on a conscious level... You want to lift it to a place that's super conscious, that's transcendent. So it becomes much more than just a thing we do. It becomes a part of who we are. And as I said, a tool, an instrument to become the true you. So instead of trying to fit all that transcendent experiences into your survival level, we're trying to elevate our survival to a transcendence place all the way to the fifth level and beyond, to silence. Not silence as a contradiction to sound, but silence as a place that is beyond tangible. You can't quite experience it in words. So when you feel that it's elusive, you know you've reached somewhere. Most people want the elusive, I want to own it. I want to control it. You don't want to control it. You want it to control you. You want to be absorbed in a higher experience not turn that higher experience into yet another pedestrian activity. Now, you want it to lift you up. You don't want to deny. We don't deny the conscious and the tangible. But we want the tangible to be be lifted up and become part of a transcendent experience, not transcendence becoming defined now by the tangible in a very structured way. You want structure to lead you beyond structure. And that's the path toward meaning and enlightenment. And if you think about it, 
takes on a whole different meaning. There's a parable. You know, recently someone asked me, where's the source of this parable? I came to the conclusion I may have made it up myself, to be very honest, you know, full disclosure. But maybe it says somewhere. I, don't, I just use it so often, at some point I thought that maybe I read it somewhere. But regardless, if you want, use it as my example. And um, that when God created the world, he asked the angels, which he always did, he consulted the angels and never listens to them, which is a whole other discussion. Maybe that's how consultants work. You hire consultants, then you don't listen to them. Maybe. Well, that's an aside. So he consults with the angels and says, should I give the human race art? All the arts, music, art. And the angels, of course, say no. They will abuse it. They will not appreciate it. They will commercialize it. They will turn it into a business. They'll trample on it. They'll take it for granted. God considers their opinion. And they add, of course, give it to us. We are celestial bodies. We are sublime. We are spiritual. We'll sing your praises. We'll use it to spiritually grow. God considers their opinion and says, no, I will give it to the human race because I want them to have something to remember me with or to remember me by. I find this to be a very, as I said, if, I may, <laughs> if it's my own, then I'm touched by my own parable. If it's not my own, then I'm very touched by it for, this, for the basic reason is to remember something greater than we are. So I remember speaking when I was a, uh, in school, I was studying with, and I asked one of, my, uh, one of my brilliant teachers, and I mean that in a serious way, I asked him, why do we learn some of these most sublime spiritual levels that we probably will never reach? And he answered, he gave me an analogy that came actually from my great-great-grandfather, my father's namesake. His name was Abgershim Ber Pahar. And the analogy he gave was of a king who was once with his, traveling with his entourage in the woods, in the forest. And they hear, he hears this most beautiful melody, song that he'd never ever heard before. And it was so captivating, and so mesmerizing, and so uplifting, he just could not tear himself away. And he said to his, to his people, he said, can you find that, that person who's playing this music? I want to bring them back to the palace. Such powerful music. Well, as much as they looked, they couldn't find the source. He comes back to the palace, but he could not put it out of his mind and his heart. And he made it his mission. He needs to find the musician who is playing or singing that beautiful melody. Of course, being the king, he sends out his teams, his messengers, his ministers, find me that music. And now, of course, he had his own musicians because nobody was able to find the source the person who had played it. So his own musicians began to play all types of music before the king in the hope that the king will, it will, be, it will remember. They said, he said, can you sing it for us? No. Play, play, play. They played the most exquisite, the most exotic, the, most, the rarest forms of music from all parts of the world. Beautiful, he says. It's great, but it's not that. He keeps saying it's not that. It's all beautiful, but it's not that. So the analogy that this, this great chassid gave was that the soul comes from a greater place, which is beyond us. We don't have an ability to reach that superconscious and super, super conscious transcendent place. We come to this world, and in this world, we look for pleasure, we look for all kinds of ways of bringing our soul, nourishing our soul, but the soul never forgets this beautiful, beautiful song it heard before it came to this world. That's the analogy. 
It may not be able to sing it, but it doesn't forget there's something unbelievable. And all our lives, we're looking for that elusive song, that lost song, lost paradise. And we do so in every possible way. We can do it through physical pleasures, through spiritual pleasures, through romance, through love, through sexuality, through all kinds of ways. We're seeking that beautiful thing. But every time we experience something, we come to realize it's not it. There's something more. And we shouldn't be down, frustrated by that or feel down by it. We should recognize it's because you sense something greater and continue seeking. That's why my, that, my teacher told me, my mentor, one of my mentors told me, that's why we learn about these deeper things. Yes, we may not be able to reach it, but at least it reminds us of something beyond us. So next time you listen to a song, or you paint or draw or watch an exquisite piece of art, or all the other arts out there, whether you yourself are an artist, or you're enjoying someone else's art, remember these are reminders of a reality that's beyond us. A reminder of who you truly are. You are not who you think you are. You're not that individual in a box that's just defined by the parameters and the language and the words that you are familiar with. There's far more going on. And some of it is elusive. Some of it is not accessible. As a matter of fact, the deeper you go, the less accessible with regular tools, I should add. But the art, the arts allow us the tools to go into deeper places to the point that you can actually experience and express the inexpressible, see the extraordinary in the ordinary. See the supernatural in the natural because it's there for our taking. But what does taking mean? No, you won't own it. It will own you. So when you think of it that way, next time you're experiencing anything on that transcendent level, look at it as a gift, as a gift from a greater place, reminding us of realities that are beyond us and eliciting in us, provoking us to aspire, to dream, to imagine, to dare go to places be transported to places that are beyond time and space. And there's really no limit of how high and how deep we can reach. Doing so will not just enhance our lives, it will enhance our relationships, it will enhance our experiences, and will make your life a living 24-7 adventure. No room for boredom or monotony when you're traveling on this, on this trajectory. So, may you use these tools that we were blessed with well, stay healthy, successful materially, spiritually, in every possible way. This has been Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center. We're at MeaningfulLife.com, where you can find more such material. Please subscribe to our YouTube and our other platforms. Share, like all the different words out there, and above all, communicate with us. Communicate with me. I'd love to hear from you. love to hear your reaction, your feedback, suggestions, ideas, different experiences. It's all part of the journey of reaching greater and more transcendent places. Be well and be blessed. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.